filling out resumes, they learn about how to do an interview, how to look somebody in their eye, because many cultures, you don't look somebody, your boss, let alone a, a friend sometimes in the eye. They do go to English language. Um, they can start within the first couple weeks of being there, going every day to learn English. And there's a couple of other places that offer English, CWI offers English at a little bit higher level for those that come in with English. And we always appreciate extra tutoring. We, um, our group actually has a Thursday morning English class with women because the women often it's hard for them to go if they don't have if they have children small children at home so we do that this is all volunteer really the English is all volunteer now they do receive health care like I said they have refugee Medicaid that lasts for eight months and as an adult they after that eight months the, the Medicaid is finished and they have to find other means to be insured. The children are insured through Medicaid until they are 18 years old. They do have to go through extensive health screenings. They have health screenings before they come. They come out of the country that they have uh, fled to. They have health screening there and then once they are here they are also screened at a main clinic in Boise called Family Medicine. What about the tuberculosis in they're, Minnesota? They're, uh, they are screened for tuberculosis and there is really good um, programs. Okay, I am being respectful. I expect respect. I am a teacher and a principal. to questions that are written on the cards, and I'd appreciate you keeping those there till then. Um, we do provide mental health services because many come with trauma, like we said, PTSD. If you can imagine, we have families who've gone through war and seen atrocities, young children that have seen atrocities, and so we do want to come alongside them and be sensitive to that. Another thing that I think people often think is that it's a free flight here, that they don't have to pay for that flight. And that is not true. It is a loan, it's a non-interest loan, but they are required to pay that flight back. And as you can imagine, we have a family of nine. So for them, working very minimal wage jobs to be able to pay that travel expense for nine people, it's not an easy thing to do, but they are committed to doing that, and they have our um, promise that they have to, to do that, and it is a revolving loan fund that does that. Who's your collection agency? <clears throat> the basic timeline of services that happens in Boise, and like I said, it's different in every city and every state, depending on the program. Some programs only run for three months, and they're expected to have a job within those three months and be self-sufficient. Um, there are other programs that they do have services for eight months. So in that first night, they're met at the airport. How many of you have ever traveled overseas and stopped in and thought about what it's like to land in that new country? Everybody's talking a different language. It's not easy. And so they are met at the airport and they're taken usually to a hotel because we can't set up housing until they're here and they can sign the lease themselves. Within that first week, they get oriented, uh, they go to help and welfare, food stamps, Medicaid, Social Security, hopefully move into an apartment and are shown where to get groceries and how to buy groceries because that's a whole new experience, um, different than maybe where they come from. Within the first month, they have home and cultural orientation, trying to help them understand this is America, this is the way we do things, and we expect you to understand and try your best to um, to come in and assimilate or integrate. Integrate is the word I wanted. They get registered for English. They have the health screening, like I said. We register the children for school. Um, they get transportation orientation. Obviously, they don't come and they don't have cars, so they are dependent on buses. They get into job class and hopefully child care. And then they have ongoing um, case management for that eight months of just trying to help them as they integrate into Boise and find jobs, um, counseling, troubleshooting, those kind of things. And then at the end of that eight months, the services are finished. If they have ex 
um, extenuating circumstances, there are people that will continue to help them. Who pays um, for every dime of what they do? They begin paying back their travel loan at the end of that year. At a year, they are allowed to apply for a green card and they're encouraged to get that so that their standing changes from the refugee to the green card carrier. And in five years, they're allowed to apply for citizenship, which is something I think really beautiful that our country offers to people who came as refugees. Please be a human being and speak about the Twin Falls rape. Everybody in this room wants to hear your yeah. opinion on that. Yeah. It's not funny. It's not that funny. I, 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 I'm not laughing at it. You just did. Yeah. You're a teacher. You know better. Horrible. Stop smiling. What's funny about I'm smiling because I'm nervous, okay? That's what everybody else is. So I hope you can be sympathetic of that. I bet that's what you're all for. It's really hard. We were going to... This... Honest, you know what's going on, woman. Why don't you let her be respectful? Zip it up. Let her do it. You guys do know what's going on. I'm so sick about it. You know what these people are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, this was not a, a, a presentation on bringing refugees to Sandpoint. That was. was a training for those that we have then asked, those that wanted to have more information on how to work productively with refugees. The internet can do that. And that's the purpose of this training. You're testing the law. We are not testing the law. We're employing the Delphi method to stifle our speech. For such a thing, and it will not be here. So, at this point, what I would like to ask you to do is to let the presenters who have traveled far, who have indeed prepared, let them speak because this is a training that they have done and they have prepared for our community. They came here with. I don't want that training. If you do not want the training, you are welcome to leave. Yes. Delphi method is being employed here and everybody feels like their voice will not be heard because it won't. This was, um, we are doing a training tonight, so I'm going to continue on on what it means to work cross-culturally. I understand that maybe for some of you that's not important, but we do want to look at what that means. How is expensive uh, your training? Does it cost anything? Yeah, it's something more involved than that. So in order to understand another culture, you have to recognize your own culture and how you've been raised and those kind of things. Um, so what is culture? Culture refers to the way of life that is comfortable and familiar for you and everyone is part of a culture. No matter what, you're part of a culture. Our culture affects our manners, our customs, our beliefs, our values, our ideas, our ideals, an accepted way of behaving. 
likes beheading people. How would you describe <laughs> the American yeah. culture? Just quickly. Greed. Law and order. Law and order. Control. Founding documents. Greed. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, how about Idaho culture? Freedom. Freedom. Hard workers. Outdoors. Responsible. Good. How about Sandpoint? Sorry, I forgot to change the photo. Beautiful. Beautiful lake in Sandpoint. Okay. Any other ways that you describe it outdoorsy here, I would assume? Okay. Hard workers. Free. Conservative. Okay. So when we talk about can talk about it in the way of cultural icebergs. There are um, things that you can see that are visible. So the part of culture that you can see is food, drink, language, etiquette, behavior, religion. Those are all things that are easy to touch and say, oh, this is part of American culture. This is part of Asian, Japanese, um, Indonesian culture. But things that we have a harder time understanding and dealing with are customs, attitudes, assumptions, beliefs, and values. And, why? and like, interesting enough, um, humor is one of those things that takes a long time to understand. All my years in Indonesia, I often still didn't get the jokes, even though I maybe understood the words. I didn't often understand the meaning behind. And so that's kind of that below the surface that takes a long time to understand when you're working with somebody from a different culture. Oops. So culture is learned. When you think, those of you that have children, think about that baby that you held and how that child learned about your family culture. What do they call an, an adult? Do they call him Mr. Or Mrs.? Do they call him Auntie Uncle? Do they, what are some things that are particular about your family? So we learn culture, and as Nick and I went to Indonesia, a lot of what we had to do was look and learn and observe. Okay, so there we shake with our right hand. We don't use our left hand. It's not considered clean. That's just something that's a part of their culture. We observe that. <laughs> describes how people in a society or a community function together. There are, of course, individual differences. We see a lot of individuals here. We also see some large community things going on here. But we can identify. We can go, oh, that person's probably from America, or that person's probably European. There's things that you go, I, I can recognize those things about them. Um, and it makes sense to the people living in it. Living here in Sandpoint or outside of Sandpoint makes sense to you. There's things that you guys probably do here that make sense, and it fits together in an integrated, logical way. Well, if you're a person coming in from the outside, there are things that won't always make sense, and so we just have to recognize that. One thing we talk about is very much the idea of ethnic centricity. We often put ourselves at the center. We are right. We have the right of way to do things. Our way is the only way. And everybody should learn how to do it. Yep. What we encourage What we encourage is ethnomutuality. The idea that I can learn from you, you can learn from me. We can learn from one another. There's beauty. I am learning a lot tonight, and I'm really thankful for that. It's not easy, but I'm learning a lot. Um, but it's an ethno-mutual. I hope that you're learning and listening as well. There's different ways we can describe culture. There's closure culture versus non-closure, and I'll read this real quick. A closure culture is a culture in which people are most comfortable when things are finished or settled. People in closure culture are quick to draw conclusions about people, issues, or ideas. They do not like ambiguity. The most important value in a closure culture is goals, setting goals, tasks, or objectives, and working to achieve them. That's one type of culture. A non-closure culture is a culture when people are very comfortable when things are open-ended. People in a non-closure culture do not draw quick conclusions. They have a high tolerance for ambiguity. The most important value in a non-closure culture is relationships. 
establishing deep, warm, and harmonious relationships with others. If we look at this, I think we as Westerners, as Americans, tend to be more on the closure culture. We're very good at relationships, and I think that's part of who we are, but we're very time-oriented. We want things done. We have goals. We have things that we want to get that, done. Where does that utopia exist? So that's just a brief kind of overview of looking at c culture when you're dealing with people from different cultures, and I hope that gives you some impact. And now Nick's going to talk about self-sufficiency. eat up the clock until there's no time left. This is brutal. I'm going to start off, uh, this is something that we use in our training, and it's a uh, video that's actually uh, taken from an organization called Tucson Refugee Ministry, and an organization that we've worked with. So I want to start off uh, just real quickly with this little skit. <laughs> Resources, or do we view them as survivors no. with resiliency, with dignity, with gifts and capacities, just like any human being would have? Uh, how we view uh, how we view others is going to determine how we respond. Do we view them as victims? Do we view them as survivors? How do we respond? If we view them as victims, we give them things. If we view them as survivors. We will walk with them and there will be empowerment, there will be participation, there will be a process by which their gifts and capacities develop. And so uh, survivors, that's what we do. Uh, this is really getting at this simple concept of a paradigm shift from a needs-based approach 
And so what we have is uh, I have a friend in Boise who came from the Congo. His name is John Kamana. He is Feed the lie, burn the lie, be headed. A single story? More than one. No, no, thousands and thousands and thousands. The Quran says that you're No Sharia law, no Quran. But the, the be best way that we can break down stereotypes is really stereotypes? stereotypes? What are you talking about? They're not stereotypes. That's a lie. Listen, I'm, I'm talking in general. You know, as we as we relate to other people, there's sometimes we draw conclusions about people because we have a limited story of that person, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about you can't that be they serious. need to have a multiplicity of stories. We need to understand people and their history, and the way that we do that is we get to know them. We sit down and we have coffee with them, and we get to know them. We sit down and have coffee in Mosul. But when we are fearful and we are suspicious, we need to be reminded that there is no fear in love, and that love drives out all fear. So with that, I just hope that this gives you a little bit of a glimpse as to why we're involved in this ministry. I know you may not agree, many of you may not agree, but that is, uh, but is, is the reason that, that we, I hope you, you get a little bit of a glimpse of why we're in this ministry. And uh, we really hope that the church responds in love and not fear. So, well, and then they'll be burned to the ground. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to the next. I'm going to go to the next section. Uh, we're going to do a, a little bit on refugee 101. And so that this will this will give you just a, a little bit of an idea of an understanding of a refugee. Can anyone tell me what a refugee is? Somebody, we Two thousand dollars per head. <laughs> One uh, convention. Are you going to quote the UN? Let him talk. Jeez. Let him lie. Is that a lot to ask? Say something. Well, listen. We all got A refugee is actually a person that because of persecution has had to flee their own country. They've brought some water. Okay, and so it's, it's really based on a self-found uh, fear of persecution or a real persecution that, that is based on uh, five different things, race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. And if you know people who have traveled the refugee highway, you will know a great deal of an, an incredible journey of resilience and people who uh, have have gone through unspeakable suffering. And I know quite a few, I know from Indonesia as well as from here. So these are the reasons that we have uh, race, religion, nationality, social group, political opinion. Now. Sir, how do you account for Sweden being the so, rape capital of the West? Yes. 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 How do you account for that? This is, this, uh, we're going to take questions at the end. Uh, this right is really in for uh, information. You may disagree with the information that I have. It's not for, the, the purpose is not to have a public debate, but we will have questions at the end. So forcibly displaced persons. Now, there may be some confusion with regard to the definition. Uh, there are refugees, there are IDPs, those that are internally displaced. They're really the same as refugees, except for the fact that they have not crossed borders. And then there's also refugees that are part of, uh, you know, the, the Palestinian camps, which they call the UNRWA, and that's the Re Belief and Work Agency of the UN, and those are predominantly uh, Palestinian, as well as you have uh, stateless, I mean, I'm sorry, the asylum seekers. And the asylum seekers would be people that come to the U.S., uh, let's say on a, on a tourist visa, uh, but they realize if they return to their country, uh, they could be killed, and so they apply for asylum with the U.S. Embassy. So those are the categories. I also have this category overlapping them all, and that's stateless. 
a lot of people don't realize that there are 10 million people in the world that are stateless, and that means they have no citizenship in any country in the world. Uh, not because of anything that they've done, uh, it's because of a, a government rejection of their own uh, identity as a citizen. The Rohingya people in Burma are one example of that. Uh, there's many Rohingya that have no country in the world and they're rejected by Burma as well as Bangladesh and India. So they, there really is no place uh, for them to go. So they're stateless and we also have uh, people that have had to become internally displaced because of natural disasters. And that's primarily who I work with in Indonesia. We are facing the, one of the greatest refugee crises that we've ever faced in, in our nation since World War II. Over 65 million people have been forcibly displaced, 22.5 as refugees, 40.3 million as IDPs, and 2.8 as asylum seekers. So the countries that they come, the source of, of refugees, the, the top countries that they're coming from are clearly uh, in the news every day, and you'll see that they come from uh, places like Syria, uh, they come from uh, places like Afghanistan, and uh, so forth. But you can see on the screen that there's 10 main countries that comprise of those, and then what are the uh, major sources of those refugees? What are the main host countries? If we go from sources, we go to host countries, the main uh, host countries are surprisingly all countries that are considered uh, developing countries, Turkey and Pakistan and Lebanon and so forth. So uh, those are the countries that uh, refugees immediately flee to. And then you also have places like Lebanon where uh, a quarter of their population is refugees. Uh, that would be the equivalent of 80 million refugees in the US something that just overwhelms their whole system. So uh, looking at some highlights in terms of uh, the sources of refugees, obviously you have Syria that's a main source of refugees in the news every day, and you have uh, over 12 million Syrians that have been displaced out of 22 million people. So that country has been devastated. You have the South Sudan, and that conflict there uh, is starting to pick up. There's both famine and conflict, and so there's more than 3.3 million people that have had uh, been forced to flee their homes. Uh, and if you look uh, at, at that, that's going to be uh, growing in the news. If you look also at uh, this whole idea of what, what, does, what are the options that a refugee has, uh, if, if you picture yourself as a refugee, uh, what options would you have? The first option is what we would call a voluntary repatriation. And that is an option to go back to your country, right? And that's really, that's really what they want to do. Every refugee wants to do that. But can they? But can they do that? You know, the in the D.C. these friends, and you're a Christian pastor? We shouldn't have to do it for them. What about the Why would you focus on them? You be quiet. No. This is not your presentation. We, we, should, we should care about the suffering of all people. You came here to be lied to. We should care about the suffering of all people, but only an estimated 3% of people have voluntary repatriation as an option. Local integration means becoming a citizen of where you fled to. Well, there's only 2 to 3% that have that option. And then third country resettlement are the refugees that come to the United States and other de developed countries primarily. 27 other countries involved in that. And then you have only less than 1% that have that option. So many, the vast majority of refugees in the world that have suffered are in protracted situations. 17 years is the average number of years that a refugee spends at a refugee camp. The global um, third country resettlement, if you look at that, that's starting, that started to grow because of the crisis grew. And so you have more participating countries, that's what that graph shows. And then you see the third uh, country resettlement in the U.S. 
and uh, we're facing the greatest refugee crisis that we've ever faced, but now that is starting to drop, like you. and we see refugees uh, <laughs> becoming less welcome and less welcome. And that's what that is. <laughs> and so this gives you the historical trends, and you see here that uh, indeed we're at the, the the numbers that we're looking at for 2017 are the lowest that they've been uh, for many, many years. And uh, we're, this is in contrast to the, the, the need, which is the highest it's ever been since World War II. How many Christian refugees? Yeah, what about the Christian refugees? Why aren't they allowed? Why only Muslims? Well, it's probably because in Germany, they love them over there, don't they? What about the rape of the 12-year-old girl in the Twin Falls? Twin Falls. So, the yeah, fourth solution is desperation. A refugee who doesn't have those oftentimes will put their children on a boat. And that boat is uh, run by people who really don't care about their lives. And so you have 4,000 people that died in the Mediterranean last year. And so you have the Rohingya. I've mentioned them. They're a special case. You'll hear more about them in the news. And so 22 uh, of the 22 million refugees uh, in 2016, there were 96,000 that were uh, actually uh, resettled in the U.S. during that same year. And of those, uh, 766 came to Idaho. And they were resettled by four different uh, agencies, three of them in Boise and one in Twin Falls. Uh, in 2016, that total was 1,066. This year, it's going to be about half of that. The, uh, the primary countries they're coming from is the Congo and Syria. Uh, Congo is predominantly Christian. Uh, is refugees. Refugee arrivals in Idaho. You know, it's going way down, and that's what this graph shows. Uh, I want to show you a summary of the screening process. This is obviously a concern for us all. I am pro-security. We need to have a safe nation. And this uh, video will uh, give you a little bit of an idea of the vetting process. Okay, so a lot of people say certain refugees There's uh, about 75 million people that cross the border into America. That's through a variety of visas. Um, there's only less than 1% are uh, actually refugees that are part of that. 
they're uh, by far the greatest uh, vetted group of any other group that comes into the US. If you look at uh, the Cato Institute policy analysis from 1975 through 2015, the chance that an American would be killed by a terrorist attack committed by a tourist is actually 3,000 times higher than it would be a refugee. Uh, 3,000 times higher than by uh, life. That, that, that's just, uh, that's just uh, based on the data that they've presented. So what, 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 it, what the data says is, is actually that the vetting process has been very effective. London terrorists were trained by an imam from Dearborn, Michigan. That's why there's 300 of them all back. Well, it's kind of the propaganda. And what we're going to talk about now is who provides help, what happens once they are here. And first of all, the people who are refugees, they themselves provide great help. If they've made it here, they've made it through a lot of different um, really hard things that they've gone through. And if they've gone, gotten to here, they have done a lot for themselves and they are their best own advocate. The federal government does provide help. They are the ones who decide the numbers, and that's why we're seeing that the numbers are going down, because that is changing. Um, but they are the ones who uh, provide the money and support the state's initiatives and what they are doing. Then we have the state and local government. States provide education to K through 12 for students that come. They also provide Medicaid, and it's a different kind of Medicaid than the, what we normally think. It is specialized Medicaid for people who are refugees. It's different than what the rest of us um, know as Medicaid. They do also receive stamps or food stamps. And the local government um, provides English classes along with, am I kind of going to the mic again too much? Okay. Um, they provide English language classes that comes money that is funneled through them, as well as job class and things like that that help them to become independent. And then in Boise, we do have several ethnic communities. Um, from way back from the 70s when um, we had Vietnamese coming in and Cambodians, then Bosnians in the 90s, and then we have um, different groups like the Congolese and the Somalis and um, Eritreans and Ethiopians. A mixture, the primary, most of them, the majority of them are believers or Christian background. Um, and they are their best help as well. Um, thank you. I appreciate your input. We're going to keep going. Then we do have resettlement um, agencies. Like we said, there are two in Boise now, International Rescue Committee. That is an agency, a worldwide agency that works throughout the world. And then um, Agency for New Americans. And that's a smaller agency that was from the Episcopalian Church, but it's uh, localized to Boise. And then, like I said, the thing that we do is connect people in Boise who are willing to engage and get to know a family that has come as a refugee and come to understanding. And they walk alongside them in that journey. And I would challenge, um, hopefully this will go okay, any of you to meet a person who's come as a refugee and talk to them. How because I think it's once you get to call. know them, them, that makes a big difference. Not once I get to here. know somebody that's different not than me, I'm not asking it to happen here in San Juan. I start, oh, I think right now you're putting words in my mouth and I am being respectful to you. I am not advocating refugee resettlement in San Juan. I am advocating understanding. Okay, what do help do refugees receive? Um, they do receive, they do not receive free housing, but the agency is required to find housing, appropriate housing. This is not um, easy right now in Boise. We're at a 2% evacuation, vacation, vacancy rate. And so it's a difficult thing right now to find affordable housing. Um, the government does supply, supply financial support, but I think you'll be interested to know that that money doesn't go on forever. It is eight months, that's what they get. It depends on the state. Some states, it's only three months. No money, zero. And they do 
receive other things like I said, SNAP and education and things no like that. Money. We, we do. They also get employment we're help. We're about our vets and we have already. We also operate a thing called Life Tree Cafe at the Tango Cafe on Monday afternoons at 2. And that's where we have uh, civil conversations and talk about all sorts of uh, issues, faith and life. Yes, yes. We uh, uh, are going to, uh, and thank you, first of all, thank you, all of you, for coming way beyond our expectations, as you can tell. But uh, we hope you'll be able to hear, and we uh, will uh, turn this over to Nick and Laura, and they will tell you more about it as we go. A couple ground rules. We're not here to uh, promote refugee resettlement at San Point. We're here to provide information, and information from people who have done refugee resettlement in Boise, I know. So they know the process and they know what people go through. So that's what we're here to present. And uh, we're not, we don't have an agenda. We're just here to have a good conversation. So, you're welcome. Can you hear me, Tom? Talk louder. Okay. Okay, I'm sure there's going to be time for questions and answers and all kinds of things. So uh, we want to get this started right away. And uh, we'll get it started just the way we start every Life Tree Cafe every week. Before we do that, um, as an act of courtesy to our speakers, would you put your cell phones on stun? Stun. <laughs> that's, that's silence or vibrate. <laughs> Also, um, if you have a question, we pass out cards at the beginning and to facilitate the question and answer process, if you have a card and you want to um, put it up, Lynn, would you collect those? And as we go along, uh, we're going to try and not do the raised hand thing to be a little bit more orderly, but if we get to that point, um, we'll recognize you. So. So again, we want you to know that you are welcome just as you are. Your thoughts are welcome. Your doubts are welcome, no matter what they are. Because we are all in this together. And believe it or not, God is here, ready to connect with each of us in a fresh way. So I would like to introduce Nick and Laura Armstrong from uh, Boise, Idaho. They co-lead an organization called GlowCal. They'll tell you more about that. And um, work with World Relief and some other agencies to resettle refugees in the US. Would you welcome them? Nick and Laura Armstrong. Sore, saya sangat senang bisa menghadiri di sini malam ini. Ini jauh lebih banyak orang di sini. What? I didn't understand a word you said. Thank you. I'm really thankful to be up here this uh, tonight. Um, this is a little bit different than what we've done. We are from Boise, but we live 23 years in Indonesia. And when we came back to the United States, we were looking for a way to integrate what we had learned and done in that country um, all those years. And one way was to get involved with working with people who are refugees. We primarily work, we now no longer have World Relief in Boise, which is sad to us, but there are two other resettlement agencies. And we primarily work to um, partner people in friendship with people who come as refugees. And that's the main focus of our ministry. We are um, out of a church in Boise, 
but we do these trainings throughout Boise at different churches and non-church organizations, mainly to give information. Um, we hope you know that we did not come here promoting refugee resettlement here in Sandpoint. We were asked to come and do a training that Jerry and Stan had seen us do in Boise just to provide information and understanding. And that's really our heart's desire. I know that there's a lot of um, feelings and strong feelings about this issue here in the United States. And um, we just hope that we can have an open, friendly dialogue. Yes, I did use Indonesian at the beginning because as a foreigner, I went to another country and I learned their language. And as people who come as refugees, they do come into the United States learning, wanting to learn English. It is not easy. Um, for many of them, they come with a lot of trauma. And if any of you have experienced trauma in your background, you know that it impacts. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, how you learn in your learning style. And so we think it's important that they learn English. Don't get me wrong. but. We're not going to take questions right now. Um, we would ask that you would write those on the cards, and we will have a time at the end. With this large of a group, it's kind of hard. If we start on questions, we won't get through any of the information. So I'm going to continue our introduction. This is a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at biblical foundations. We are Christians. I know everybody in this audience may not be followers of Jesus. That's fine. Um, but we're going to go ahead and give just that little bit of a background. Why we, Nick and I, and many others feel like it's important. Where does it? Where do we find this in the Bible that it's important to welcome the stranger? We're going to go over Refugee 101. Now that's probably where a lot of the feelings are going to come up and there's going to be a lot of questions. But if you can just hang tight, listen to the information, and then we'll talk about that. Um, we'll take questions at the end. We will look at cross-cultural orientation, because when you work with people, we all have cultures. And that's something that we're going to talk about. Northern Idaho has its own culture, doesn't it? It's different than Boise, Idaho. It's different than New York City. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at self-sufficiency, because that's something that is important. We want people who come as refugees to become independent. We want them to not um, continue um, being on government help, and Nick will explain that they're not on it that long, um, but, okay, I asked you to be patient with me, um, but we'll just, we're going to look at that. We do want it to grow in independence in ways that we, sometimes as Americans, create dependence and how to be careful about that. And then we're going to look at experiencing loss and what trauma does to a person. And um, that can be something that's really maybe impacted some of you as well, and just to talk through that. So um, as much as possible when I am talking, I will use the term a person who's a refugee, a mother who's a refugee, or just a mother, a father, a survivor, a new American. Just like any of us, we want to be recognized as a person first. We don't want to have that label. Um, many people who come as refugees do become US citizens. And they are not refugees the rest of their lives. And so it's important to us that we put the person first. I do ask that you, we're going to go through a community agreement. And I'm hoping that we can come to an agreement at the end of this. Just the idea that you agree to stay engaged, that means putting away distractions such as cell phones, putting them on stun. I like that. Um, just to be engaging participants. I agree to be OK with experiencing discomfort. I'm experiencing some discomfort right now because this is a different kind of training than we've done before. And this is a lot more people than we usually have. But that we can be OK with that. I agree to speak from my own truth. And I think this one is really important. I spent 23 years, we spent 23 years in the largest populated Muslim country. I speak from that truth of knowing people, my neighbors that were Muslim, day in and day out, loving on me, um, telling me we will protect you if anything happens. That is my truth. I recognize many of you come from a different truth and a different background. And I will accept that and be OK if you can respect my truth and what I am saying as well. 
I agree to expect and accept non-closure to certain issues. We're not going to solve this tonight. I am so excited that there's this many of you, but we are not going to solve this issue and come maybe to a peaceful agreement at the end. I hope we can be peaceful in our discussion, um, but there is going to be non-closure in this training tonight. So, uh, why am I? Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Got to have the right way. So, I'm going to give the microphone to Nick. Thanks. Thanks, sweetheart. Well, good evening. Hey. It's really nice to be here. I love Sandpoint. By the way, this is my first time here. Uh, this was my first is my first time in Sandpoint, and I love it here. It is incredibly beautiful, and uh, yeah, I am envious uh, of, of what you have here. Uh, since Laura and I went to Indonesia in 1990, like Laura had mentioned, uh, there have been about that's about two and a half decades. Um, there's been about 15,000 people that have come to Idaho as refugees. Um, that means that there's the cultural landscape, the whole, um, okay. All right. So the whole cultural landscape has changed. We live in an increasingly localized world where our local world is uh, increasingly becoming a global world, and that's the nature of things. And so I really feel like it's important, especially for those of us uh, who are following Jesus, but for all, uh, to really get our, our minds around what that means and what, what it means to, uh, to face this sort of new reality of a globalized world. Uh, LifeWay Research said that, uh, this is just uh, a research that was done uh, this year, nine out of 10 pastors agree that Christians should care sacrificially for those who are foreigners and refugees. Uh, one in five Christians, uh, only one in five Christians, were actually challenged by their pastors in this regard. And then if you look at the congregations of those same pastors, twice they're twice as likely to fear refugees as they are to help refugees. And only 8% of the churches are act actively involved. So. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the reality we're facing. We're facing a globalized world, and so I'm, I'm going to actually make a couple of observations from Scripture, from my viewpoint, um, and I believe it's important that we wrestle with Scripture, and that Scripture informs how it is we respond. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple of observations. The first observation that I make from Scripture is that God has a special concern for the stranger. Uh, if we look uh, at, at Jesus' own life, Jesus was a refugee. He had to flee Herod's tyrannical rule, go to Egypt, his family. Um, and we actually have some handouts with respect to a lot of other biblical characters that were also uh, lived lives uh, that you could consider refugee. But this is uh, something that's profound in my life. Uh, and it's profound, I think, to think about that, that fact and the fact that Jesus said, uh, you know, as we, uh, in the final judgment, those of you who are following me, in as much as you have fed and clothed and welcomed the least of these, you've done so to me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. So I think this is an amazing window into God's heart. If we look at the Hebraic scriptures, there's a word called ger. It's a Hebrew word used 92 times within the Hebrew scriptures, meaning to welcome the script, uh, to welcome the stranger. It's the most oft-repeated command, barring the command to worship the one and only God, and it's used in conjunction with two other very vulnerable categories of people, and that is the fatherless and the widow. And if we read this in Psalm 146, the Lord watches over the resident alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. And then we see another amazing things where he reiterates this warning uh, when they are going in the desert, they're about ready to go into the promised land and this warning is given to them that was first given to them when they fled Egypt. And it's from Leviticus, it says, God says this, the stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native among you and you shall love him as yourself. You were aliens in the land of Egypt. 
I am the Lord your God. Now, what I want us to notice here is it's more than you shall love your, uh, your you know, the stranger, but this is actually a command that's based on their own experience. So their historical memory should inform how they are to treat the resident alien. And so I would guess that most of us in this room have a, some, some sort of a, uh, of a background where we have an immigrant story in our background. Um, so just as Israel is to remember their history, we should remember ours. Uh, there's a gal from our home church by the name of Annie Johnson. She is uh, Khmer Chinese, which is Cambodian. Her uh, family had to flee the Khmer Rouge in the 70s. And a brutal regime. They killed many people. They killed most of her family. They fled to Thailand. They lost everything. And so they were welcomed by a couple in North Dakota by the name of Thurston and Kristen Nelson. And it was this compassion and the, the way in which they helped this family get on their feet. Annie said, you know, she, Annie was actually born in North Dakota. She wasn't even born at that time that they fled. But she said, this is what inspired me to get involved here with your refugee ministry. And that kind of segues into the second observation, and it's simply this, is that God's concern for the stranger is expressed through real people. And we see this in the book of Luke. Uh, uh, we see Ruth is going to Bethlehem with Naomi, and she is isolated from community. She's missing everything that's familiar. She's desperate for food, and so she is in the field. And Boaz, the, har the Lord of the harvest, he goes to that field. And he looks and he sees Ruth and asks who she is. And the answer is, she's a forbidden Moabite. But what is his response? Instead of kicking her out, he seeks her out. He goes to her. He greets her in a dignified way. He shelters her, gives her safety, and he does this unthinkable thing as he stoops down and he serves her. He invites this forbidden Moabite to his own table. And so they share this meal of roasted grain, and then he showers uh, another 30 to 50 pounds worth of food, which is about half a month's wage, on her. This leads to a romance of redemption, as you know. And they get married, and they have a child whose line will one day lead to the quintessential kinsman redeemer, Jesus. So here we have a story that shows God, uh, God's faithfulness and his concern for the foreign the foreigner, and he uses Boaz to do this. So in the, in, in the, uh, of the Bible, we have a story about a Moabite woman. We also have the story, you know, and Moabites were hated. Uh, they were hated people in Israel. Uh, Samaritans, they were, they were hated as well. And then Jesus tells a story about using a Samaritan as actually an example of neighborly love. And so why is it that Jesus uses these people uh, as prominent within scripture? Uh, one is that he cares for the oppressed, he cares for the strangers. But I think there's another reason is that he wants his hearers to hear another story about Moabites and Samaritans. He wants them to have an, an alternative story where they actually begin to see them as real people, as people made in God's image and capable of compassion real people that are in need of love and welcome and friendship. And so what do I mean by a single story? I want to show just a, a quick uh, TED talk. It's just a, a clip from a TED talk by Chimamanda Adichie, and she is a Nigerian storyteller. Um, she tells the story, the, 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 uh, the TED talk is entitled The Danger of the Single Story, and she tells about how she herself fell into the danger of the single story, so you'll understand what I'm talking about here. I too am just as guilty of the question of the single story. A few years ago, I visited Mexico from the US. The political climate in the US at the time was tense, and there were debates going on about immigration. And as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were fleecing the healthcare system, sneaking across the border, being arrested at the border, that sort of thing. I remember walking around on my first day in Guadalajara, watching the people going to work, rolling up to tears in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. 
I remember first feeling slight surprise, and then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans that they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrant. I had bought into the single story of Mexicans, and I could not have been more ashamed of myself. So that is how to create a single story. Show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. Nigeria is under constant threat because of its Muslim population. You surely know that. Yeah. 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 That's right. So bring the threat. Could it be that 